in your business, you have very sensitive data. You have information that only your company should have access to and certainly not your competitors. But you turn on your computer and there it pops up, a message. Your data has been breached. We now control your system and you must pay us a ransom to get your data back. Is this out of a spy movie or a spy novel or is this real life? Unfortunately, this is real life and happening a lot. And my guest today, Michael Beecher of Escape Wire, talks about how really precious and, and, and fragile uh, our data security is and the steps we need to take to ensure that we do not get hacked and that our data for our businesses is safe and protected and we can continue to grow our businesses. This is a wonderful conversation. Michael is so well-spoken. And we go a little deeper on, well, what does this mean for international politics? What does this mean for, uh, you know, if if the supply chain gets disrupted or, you know, we can't get food in our country or water in our country for a few days? We kind of talk about that. So it's an interesting conversation, but one with a lot of really sound advice and even gives you some uh, government resources at the end that are absolutely free that you can do a risk assessment on your business to make sure that you are protected. Enjoy. Mike is a partner and the president of Buffalo, New York-based EscapeWire Solutions. EscapeWire is a managed technology and cybersecurity consulting and services firm with clients throughout the U.S. And EscapeWire was founded in 2003 and has twice won the Inc. 500 Award for Fastest Growing Companies in America. Mike's role at EscapeWire is to provide organizational direction as well as sales and business development leadership for the company. And he has over 16 years of experience in the technology services field with focus on assisting small and mid-sized organizations and help them fully realize the ROI of strategic investments that they make in information technology. Today, we're going to talk a lot about cyber cybersecurity. We're going to talk about how fragile our economy can actually be around IT and, and the flow of information uh, and data security. So this is going to be a, a fun, interesting, and, and probably pretty compelling uh, episode. I already, I already have a feeling. Um, Mike, could you you know, before we really get into the nuts and bolts of what's going on in our economy, and, and it, as we record this episode today, coincidentally, this will come out in a couple months, but as we record it today, there was a global outage, you know, um, uh, of, of data that grounded airplanes, you know, shut down um, payment terminals, you know, even Starbucks app wasn't working because they couldn't take payments. Um, and so we'll talk about that. But before we get into that, how did you get into IT and cybersecurity? Like what, what, what made you pivot to go into that? Uh, yeah, so a little bit, a little bit of background, I guess, and that'll yeah. that'll get you there. So, um, I was I'm not from the I'm not from the IT world. I didn't grow up, you know, tinkering with computers in my garage. Uh, you know, I grew up and went to college in the late '80s when you know we were still on paper and there were sure. no phones. Uh, I do remember a fraternity brother of mine. Maybe when I was a junior, he had this he had this com computer uh on his desk in his in his room it was a leading edge computer it was a orange screen really was just a word processor yeah. uh and I, I still remember that but there was none of that right and it just wasn't really a part of it i went to work after college for the hertz corporation uh in their equipment rental division because my family was in that business and i decided to go out and take an opportunity to work for a bigger company in that industry and i worked for them for a couple of years and uh, they were they had some of the first IBM uh, PCs, as it were, uh, and yeah. we use those on a daily basis. Uh, we were in the sales; I was in the sales coordination side of the business, and uh, so I got some exposure there. Uh, and then uh, after my time at Hertz, I went back to Buffalo and worked for my family for uh, about ten years. And uh, uh, I knew and and saw the need for organizing and computerizing our operations. We were a paper based operation at that time, so that was you know, that was early nineties. Uh, and I talked my father at the time into allowing me to implement our first computer systems to link our branches and be able to write invoices and orders and track equipment and things like that. So I, I put that in, I actually hired a friend of mine who I went to high school with who was in the computer business at the time. Uh, and I hired him to network our stores and uh, help us install this software system. So that was kind of my first exposure to the to the world of that. And then um, uh, in the late 90s, we decided to sell that business. And uh, I was looking for the next kind of step in what I wanted to do with my life. 
and for a lot of different reasons, wanted to make a change. We sold the business and I went back to my friend who at the time was still running his com computer business, a different version of it, a larger company at the time. And I just was talking to him about opportunities and business careers and things like that. And uh, I was keenly interested in, in computers and networking uh, because I felt that it was one of those businesses that didn't have a roof on it. You could do it with whatever, you could go as far as you wanted to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and he offered me a job and I went to work for his company. He had uh, about 20 employees and about four or five partners. And uh, I went to work uh, as a systems administrator and I didn't really know anything about networking or computers other than what I had done with the previous company. And I was kind of more of a sales and I've always been a sales and marketing guy. And, uh, you know, I said to him, you know, maybe I'd be better off coming in, you know, on the sales side. And he's, and he said to me, which is the, some of the better advice I've ever gotten. He said, well, it's a little difficult to come in on the sales side with no background in it because you're talking the technical language that you don't really understand. And he's like, if you're willing to invest in yourself and you commit on the systems administration side and learn the networking side of it, you'll be better sales and marketing person. Yeah. So I took a little bit of a gamble. Um, I had a young family at the time. I had a, a, I had one of my three kids at the time and my wife was working. Uh, so I quit my, I, we sold the business and I went to work for this company. And I remember, I've told this story before, I remember walking into the network room with all the systems engineers on my first day. And, you know, my, my, my friend who had hired me was off in another part of the building. And I walked in and, and, uh, I said, Hey, I'm Mike Beecher here. I'm, I'm starting today. And they're like, all right, cool. Well, here's a lap, here's a laptop, windows 98. Uh, why don't you, uh, F disk that and reload the OS on that. I'll get you started and you can use that. And I was like, and I looked at the guy and I'm like, no idea what you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh. I have no idea what you're talking about. And he's like, well, are you starting here in the engineering division? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm here to start. And he's like, who hired you? And I'm like, well, McCarthy hired me. He's like, oh God. <laughs> and so... Uh, I just started like, I grant, I'm like, well, just teach me how to F disc and teach me how to load this. And I'll, I'll, I'll work on that for the day. So yeah. I, you know, I just worked, you know, really hard to, uh, you know, studied outside of work. I tagged along with their engineers. I learned stuff as I went, uh, you know, I was, and I, and I loved the business. I was, I loved, you yeah. know, it was tinkering and, and it, I, it suited me in that respect. Uh, so Lo and behold, five years later, m that guy and me, we actually ended up leaving that company. We started our own company. We ran there for a couple of years. Uh, we sold part of it. Uh, we ended up merging with a, a group, another group. Uh, and then he and I amicably went separate ways. And I, this was like 2007, and I took a small group of guys uh, and that were working for us and in a larger company, and I, I split them off and I started my own company. And I ran that company for about three or four years. And then um, I happened to have a good business relationship with my current partner. Uh, he was, that's a skateboard, the, the genesis of the, of the company today. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was doing IT work primarily in the hotel and hospitality industry. Uh, his family owned, uh, continues to own a series of hotels. And back then, in those days, the hotels, you know, they were rapidly implementing technology and the uh the franchisors you know the hiltons and the and the hyatts of the world were mandating to their franchisees like you need to put in guest wi-fi and you need to put in digital signage and you need to put tv distribution systems in and so these guys were scrambling to try to figure all that out and how to do it so they decided instead of trying to go find third parties that they would just start a little internal division and that was the genesis of escape wire so um and then i came along uh, and I, like I said, I, I had a personal business relationship with these guys, uh, and we worked together for a couple of years in the same office space, but as separate companies. And then in 2010, we decided to merge the company together, the companies together, uh, gotcha. and we kept the Escape Bar name. And that's the genesis of kind of where Escape Bar is today, uh, and how I kind of got started in this yeah, business. I, so I love the story of walking in. Uh, no Abla IT. <laughs> None. That's like great. literally zero. <laughs> that is great. So, so what? Um, you know, if you were to give a thirty-second elevator pitch, what does Escape Wire do for your clients? So we, I mean, we manage IT operations for our client base, usually small to mid-sized companies, anywhere from you know ten to one hundred and fifty employees. Um, for, in most cases, we're managing it from 
what I call the firewall down to the CEO's iPhone. So all of that in between. Uh, and um, because I didn't really come from an IT background, my focus has always been on the business side of IT and, and, and how that can be an important component and how do you run it. And most small businesses really, they can't afford a CIO level, CTO level resource. Sure. So we, we fulfill that role for them. Uh, and we help them guide, you know, to make the right decisions for IT, run their systems, uh, and do the right thing uh, when it comes to information technology and how we can leverage it for their the betterment of their in their, of their business. Uh, yeah. So that's us. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So let, let's jump into this. What what are some of the most kind? And let's let's stick with small to mid sized businesses. That's mainly uh, a lot of the listeners on that. I mean. Uh, there's a lot of listeners that are, you know, have executive level positions in, in bigger companies, but they probably have a CIO or a CTO. Um, so if we st stick with small and mid-sized businesses, what are the most common cybersecurity threats that a small to mid-sized business needs to watch out for? Uh, well, you know, there's many. Uh, yeah. the, the biggest threats that we see today, a lot of the attack surface today is focused around email. Okay. Um, you know, trying to fool an employee to click on a link, uh, yeah. you know, or to respond to an email that they shouldn't, uh, or the attack on an, on an email inbox or an email system, you know, Microsoft office 365 and or Gmail for that matter. I mean, most yeah. of our clients are on office 365, but Gmail is the same, you know, it's one of the most attacked internet services out there. You know, I mean, it's constantly getting attacked to yeah. see if they can find weaknesses and entry points. And once they can breach a Microsoft 365 tenant and get in to the to the to the back end of an email system, then they can re reap all sorts of damage, uh, you know, uh, taking over accounts, um, doing all sorts of nasty stuff. So that for us is probably one of the biggest threats out there is making sure their email is protected. Um, and then, you know, clearly they can also have other threats. Uh, you know, direct threats, you know, an intrusion into a network. Um, and then, you know, things like ransomware, crypto lockers, things like that. This segment is sponsored by Rockbox Fitness Franchising. Take control of your destiny and join the boutique fitness revolution with Rockbox Fitness. If you're ready to make a real impact in your community and own your own business that empowers people to achieve their best life, then Rockbox is the opportunity you've been looking for. They provide comprehensive support from site selection, upfit, training, and turnkey marketing so you can open your studio with confidence and a strong recurring revenue member base. Visit rockboxfitness.com and click on franchise opportunities to learn more about this exciting venture in the fast growing boutique fitness industry. It's time to turn your passion for fitness and for business into a thriving venture. We've all gotten those emails and actually my employees get them, you know, that they're disguised as me, you know, it's a different email address, but they're disguised as me. And, um, you know, as the CEO, you know, Hey, open this link for me or, or hey, fill the, fill this, fill the survey out for me real quick, you know, and it's, oh, yeah. all what, the time. what are they looking to do? Is it, are these just, are they looking to just wreak havoc or do they get in the email system and they say, okay, now fork over some cash and we'll give it back to you. Like yeah. what, what is usually the, I mean, money drives the world. So is that what they're yeah. looking to do? Yeah, I mean, oftentimes it's it's a it's a crime of opportunity. You know, yeah. they're looking for any weakness they can exploit, and when they find one, they'll exploit it. So, yeah. you know, it can range from, uh, you know, certain types of fraud and theft. So, a, a couple examples would be an a, an employee gets an email from the CEO or their boss that says, "Hey, you know, I need you to set up this wire transfer and go ahead and please wire transfer this information," and the person go ahead and click, you know, go ahead and does a wire transfer based on yeah. the instructions that they got. And that money didn't go to the, the right per person because that CEO never did that in the first place. Yeah. Uh, that would be one. Um, and the other wire transfer fraud that we see a lot is what they call man in the middle fraud, where they've actually breached and they've breached an a, a email system. They're watching the trend, the emails going back and forth. They're seeing the conversations. And then at the right time, when there's say a financial trans transaction going on, they insert themselves with an email that is not legit, and then they redirect the funds. 
So that oh. those things happen way too often. Uh, and, and I mean, I, you know, we, we didn't, we weren't directly involved, but, uh, there's a great case up here in this area where there were two parties on a real estate transaction and the payments were to be done, wire transfers were to be done. And there was a man in the middle, in the middle of those, watching those transactions. And at the right moment, they inserted their communication email into that transaction flow and a $10 million payment was made and it didn't go to the wrong, right person. It was stolen. Are you, are you just, I mean, the bank's like, hey man, sorry that happened, but you're SOL at that point, right? Like there's well, no- At that point, you can expect the lawsuits will start to fly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the insurance agencies will start to get involved because yeah. uh, someone's gonna have to pay for the $10 million loss and yeah. there's gonna be litigation and anything else you can imagine. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, those are the, those are the, some of the biggest threats that we see. We, I mean, there still are obviously crypto locker ransomware threats that are out there as well. Um, yeah. And those are happening on a, on a regular basis. Um, I mean, just uh, in the past couple months, you've seen car dealership systems for m many dealerships in the comp company, those got crypto locked, those got ransomware attacked. And that, that massive platform was completely breached, was completely overtaken. And they, and they, they basically had to shut it down um, because uh, they got attacked and the people that attacked them wanted tens of millions of dollars to release it. I mean, I had taken my car into ser for service. This was four weeks ago, I uh, dropped it off. And this is just as it was beginning. And I walked into the service department. And I said, hi, hey, I got my car and dropped it off my car. And the guy's like, yeah, you know, we can't get into our systems today. I'm just going to hand right up your service uh, need. And then um, I'm like, well, what do you, you know, what do you think? He's like, well, we can't even order parts right now. I'm like, okay. So I left it there for two days why, and then get back to my office, do a quick Google search and see this is just the beginnings of that attack. And I'm like, oh yeah. boy. Yeah. And then I read like there's 15,000 dealers across the United States on that platform using wow. that service. And my car was there for three days. I called them back and I said, what's the status? And they're like, uh, we can't even order parts at the moment. I'm like, okay, well, listen, I'm going to come pick my car up and <laughs> sure, uh, I'll come sure. back in a couple of weeks. And subsequently came back in a couple of weeks. This is two weeks later. And I called the guy and I said, how's it going? And he's like, mm, well, we got some things up. We're not fully up. This is two weeks. Wow. This is 15,000 dealers yeah. that are just completely done. Uh, hundreds and of millions uh, they of dollars. were able to order yeah. some parts and I got my car fixed, but um, they're still reeling from that. Yeah. Uh, so the crypto locker ransomware stuff, I mean, we've had clients early on that got that, you know, this is, this is like in the early days of that eight years ago or so. Um, and, uh, it really caused us, it, 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 that's one thing that keeps a guy like me up at night. Yeah. Um, because you know, your clients entire business is at risk at that point. I mean, anybody who can tell me that they can survive without all of their data, their computer systems, their databases, I'd like to see that business. Yeah. Uh, because nobody really today, very few can, uh, and it, it keeps me up at night. It used to keep me up a lot worse than it does today. We've built protective, uh, platforms and services around backup and disaster recovery, the ability to, to, to respond to, a, 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 an event like that. And the protection measures that we have in place today are much better than they were when they first came out because there was yeah. not a lot. And I remember going to, uh, you know, industry trade shows when this was still happening and be like, so what are you guys doing for this kind of stuff? And they're like, oh, we don't, we don't really have an answer yet. We're working on yeah. stuff. And I'm like, that was, to me, was a wake up call for, yeah. for how we run our business and how we focus. And it started really to turn our focus towards cybersecurity and the nuts and bolts of IT service that we do every day is great. But, you know, if we're not protecting our clients, uh, networks and their assets and all of that, then we're not really doing a, a service to them, a proper service. So that yeah. was kind of where we stand with that. Yeah. You know, you say, show me that business. And I, I don't think it exists either. Um, you know, I own uh, several businesses, but one of them is a brick and mortar that has a cloud-based POS system. And, you know, when the internet goes out, like, I mean, Spectrum or AT&T or whatever, when that goes out, we're done. Like, yeah, you're like, done. Hey, like we can't ring up anything. We can't, it's, it is crazy. And I mean, that's not a cyber attack. That's just the internet service provider going down for a couple of hours, yeah. but it is crazy how everything runs off the cloud now. Yeah. And when you lose connection, your business comes to a screeching halt. Yeah. A screeching yeah. halt. But I will, you know, I will, I will tell you though, that despite the weaknesses that you, that you can, we can all certainly document with cloud-based services, um, 
cloud-based services comparative to on-prem services like that we used to have, or mm -hmm. we still do, but try to eliminate. I'd rather have my stuff in the cloud secured by larger organizations with more resources for cybersecurity than I would having it sitting on a server in an office with a, you know, a cable modem attached to it, uh, yep. quite honestly. And, at, you know, over the last couple of years, we've been making a hard push to push our clients' servers off-site and get their applications out. Because I do feel like that on-prem vulnerability is greater than the vulnerability you'll see in the cloud. Uh, and, and, and for us, it's a way, you know, when we were experiencing those cyber attacks against our clients in ransomware and crypto locker back a few years ago, you know, a lot of our clients still had email servers on-prem. It was before Microsoft 365 really became popular, Gmail for that matter. Um, you know, so you have their accounting application, you might have a order CRM application all running on multiple servers. Um, and, you know, I just, I looked at that and I said, that is, that is such a weak point for everybody. And that really, when Microsoft 365, when they finally got that service to a business level, when it was really able to be widespread deployed commercially, we were pushing our clients like at the point of, you know, right, like you need to move. We are moving you fast yeah. because our thought was instead of having everything in one location, let's start to decentralize all of their IT. So you get your email in one system, you get your CRM in another system, you get your accounting package in a different system. So yeah. they can't get you with, with one attack. They can't take everything down. Yeah. They might take your email down. They could get your CRM knocked down or something like that, but they couldn't take everything down. There's always to us also the default weakness of just the physical office space. You sure. know, you've got a one internet connection, which, you know, the guy four blocks away putting a telephone line in, cut the fiber line, then the internet's down, they don't have a backup. There's a storm, there's a fire. All those things were like, let's try to detach our employees from their physical offices. And really the pandemic in 2020 in the lockdowns, that was the that was really the big push that we were able to kind of get clients to to start to detach from their offices, primarily because yeah. they had to detach from their offices. And we use that as a as a as an inflection point in our business. And we said, okay, these people are going to go remote. Well, they'll probably eventually come back, but we're going to make it so that they they don't have to come back. And then if they want to work remote, which many of them still do we do, I do, uh, that they can do that seamlessly at the same level of quality, at the same level of speed. And we've been honing that, you know, over the years uh, to a point where we don't really care where a client resides anymore. You know, we don't really, doesn't matter to us anymore because everything is done really remotely. Uh, and the only times we really go on site is when there's a problem in some stupid office. Sure. Switch went sure, down. Sure. Oh, that firewall had a problem. The internet went down. You know, let's decentralize yeah. and make yourself yeah. safer. You've referred several times to they when they, uh, you know, put a crypto lock on your on your stuff when they breach your. Who is they? Like, is there this, you know, archetypal, you know, cyber criminal that you know is this, you know, there's, is it all in Russia? Is it all in China? Is it here in the states and some kid in his mom's basement? Yeah, or is it all that? Like, what? Who are they? Uh, it's that's a good question. I mean. If I had a guess, I'd primarily say it was a pretty much, it was a lot of it was overseas, Eastern Europe, yeah. uh, China, Asia. Yeah. Cybercrime and fraud has actually become a business to them. So the initial exploits that were done, those, those ransomware, crypto locker, a lot of those were, you know, Eastern European, Russia, China. Um, as that business, to them, it's a business. It's a multi-billion dollar <laughs> business, actually. Sure, um, as sure. that matured, those those original groups of people mold, mold, you know, morphed into organizations, criminal organizations, some of them state sponsored, you know, some of them independent. Um, you know, as they morph that, they realized that they could actually take the exploits that they had developed and written and the and the and the ways to attack an organization, and they could actually bundle those into things that they could sell. And they would go, so they would find, you know, they'll they would find various exploits uh, for organizations all over the place, commercial entities, and they will actually post them and sell them on the on the quote unquote dark web. So you could go in and you could buy an exploit and then use whatever tools you use to try to, to get, you know, do your thing. They're focused on bigger wow. things, right? Yeah. So 
for instance, like we had a we had a client, we have a client, small um, printing company, um, and this goes back. It was the early days of the crypto locker stuff, and in the early early days of the crypto locker stuff, at least the ones that we experienced was you get a crypto locker attack, you get the you get the window come up on your screen, you know, uh, click this. If you want to, re- you know, if you want to decrypt your files, it would give you an instruction set. You would have to go get Bitcoin if you wanted to. If you wanted to decrypt, so if you weren't, if you were going to try to decrypt, what 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 we found happened oftentimes then was we had protected the servers, so we could recover the servers, but you'd get like the CEO would have his three of his Excel spreadsheet reports sitting on his desktop, as opposed to his server, and we weren't. We generally back up desktops unless yep. we're explicitly asked to. So all of a sudden, but his laptop got crypto locked because he was the he was the one who got attacked and he yep. had to have those files back. He would come to us and say, I got to get these. I have to have these files like I got to have them. They're like my reporting file, my Excel spreadsheets that I used to run the company uh, outside of his accounting system. Um, so there were a handful of times when we actually went through the process of buying the Bitcoin going yeah. to take cash out, going to a bank, making a deposit, buying the Bitcoin, and then getting the Bitcoin wallet, and then transferring the Bitcoin to the instruction set that we got on our screen on the computer. And then in those days, we, pretty successfully, they would send us the decrypt codes and we yeah. would decrypt the device and it worked. Yeah. Well, that whole thing changed because they, I guess they were honest at that time, per se. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so <laughs> honest criminals. It changed. So, so the first example of when I when I was talking about, you know, it you can buy these things on the quote unquote dark web. So we had a client. They got they got breached. Um, they got their server locked. They got the message, and um, against our best uh, recommendations to the CEO, I said, "Listen, we have a backup. Let's restore this." And he said, "No." I want to decrypt it. I want to. I don't want to go through that process. It's painful. I want to try to decrypt it. I'm like, I don't think you should do that. Well, so he contacts the got the people at that point, and by his own, I don't know how he did it, but he actually got into an email conversation with these people. He bought the Bitcoin. He sent it to the guy. The guy sends the the decrypt codes back. They don't work. Mm-hmm. He goes back to the guy. The decrypt codes don't work. I mean, this is like crazy stuff. Uh, and the guy basically said, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I bought your exploit and I bought the codes off the internet. So I just, he was like an, a, like an amateur hacker. Yeah. And he bought this crap, got, got in, found an exploit, got in, and then he couldn't fix it. So we ended up restoring it from backup anyways. Yeah. Uh, so these kind of things, you know, go on all the time. And thankfully the technologies have increased. So, you know, we're, we're doing a much better job of protecting our clients. You know, the concept yeah. of zero trust, you know, where you don't, you know, no, nothing is trusted except what you explicitly say is trusted. That yep. has been a great system and methodology for helping to protect um, our our clients and our customers. Yeah. This segment is sponsored by Beamlight Sauna Franchising. Are you looking to take control of your destiny and own your own business? Do you want a great brand in a rapidly growing market? Well, Beamlight Sauna is a nationwide health and wellness franchise with amazing opportunities in select markets. You can bring the power of infrared sauna and red light therapy to your community while you build a thriving business. Beamlight Sauna offers support that includes site selection, build out, even pre-launch programs and turnkey marketing so you can open your studio with a large recurring revenue member base. To learn more about business ownership and franchise opportunities in the fast-growing health and wellness space, go to beamlightsauna.com. That's B-E-E-M, lightsauna.com. And click on Franchise Opportunities to learn more. I've had many conversations with with folks around just our economy, and and it was more centered around um, how much debt, you know, not just our multi-trillion dollar national debt, but just how much consumer debt, um, you know, rising interest rates with adjustable mortgages, like it just feels like, oh my God, we're, you know, here we go again. And, you know, the, our whole economy, when you really, if you really look behind the curtain, at, at the, at, you know, it's toothpicks and duct tape and chicken wire holding all this stuff together. Yeah. We see that when any major event happens, Yeah, you know, it everything falls apart. Yeah. How, 
I can't imagine that that cybersecurity and our da- and data breaches are, are that much different, and that you know we're one giant hack away from our economy coming to a, a grinding halt. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I I said it today to uh, one of my colleagues. We were talking about the um, CrowdStrike issue today, yep. right? And I said to my one of my colleagues, I said, you know, mutually assured destruction, mad, used to be nuclear weapons. Russia had them, we had them. And yep. we knew we could kill each other, so we didn't kill each other, right? Yep. Well, I'm a firm believer that that has now also morphed into information technology. If you don't yeah. think that they have access to our utility systems and our grid, and we don't have access to theirs, I think you're probably mistaken, right? Yeah. And if if Russia decided that we they were going to try to take down our power grid, well, we could say we could take down your power grid, so we don't do it. We don't yep. blow each other up. But who's to say that there couldn't be, you know, an event that would cause some kind of an exchange where you could see something like that, maybe not a complete obliteration of systems, but partial obliteration of systems or some type of thing that could hurt, you know, uh, another country's economy. Um, yeah. And and I, I'm a firm believer that they have access and the ability to do it to us just like we do to them. Uh, and know. the, the yeah. issue is, is that it, everything is so interrelated today. Everything is interrelated. You know, the, all these systems eventually tie together over the internet and systems are related, are relying on other systems to keep working. Uh, you know, one, one bad software update, you know, that's pushed down to a Windows operating system across millions of devices, like what happened today to CrowdStrike, because other industries are relying on the Windows operating system, like airlines, uh, then that can take down airline systems, even though it has really yep. nothing to do with airlines. It has everything to do with a bad software update for a Windows uh, uh, Windows update. And all of a sudden it has all these reverberating effects because these things are tied together so closely. All these intricate systems are all yep. balanced on you know these various points. Uh, and one of those points is if it has a significant issue like what happened today, it can impact multiple other areas of the economy you know how much you know how much money was lost today because these airlines couldn't get their flights off yeah so. you know i my, my morbid thought is that a, a, you know russia china some whatever you know any country decides to take out a power grid or take out you know a logistics software what whatever where we as a society have just like a seven day shortage of food or water yeah because everybody thinks we're such a civilized society yeah you take away food and water and not not allow people to know when it's coming back yeah and in 24 hours it's murder in the streets oh, there's like it now. is every man for himself like wow. you know our society I mean, would would crumble in a very yeah. short order it'd be like walking dead the walking dead yeah yeah they don't have to attack us they just have to turn off the water and the food yep. and we'll take care of the rest yep. you know and i and 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 the, like i said earlier mutually assured destruction the threat of us doing it to them is the same thing that keeps them from saying we sh- we we could do it, we should do it, because they know that they, it would happen to them too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so I would love to know too your thoughts on machine learning, AI. You know, how does that? Where do you see that impacting this topic we're talking about today? You know, cybersecurity, because I would think AI, the fact how fast it can learn machine learning, how fast it can learn. How, I guess it would help both, right? It helps the criminals mm-hmm. get faster, better, quick, but it also helps you get faster, better, quicker at protecting it, I would imagine. So is yeah. that does it balance out or where do you see AI and machine learning playing, playing in this? It's a good question. It's so early on in the evolution of it. It's hard to envision where it will go uh, yeah. and how, how it will impact, let's say, our customers. You know, I mean, I could talk about multinational corporations, but I think about in terms of how does it impact my customers? Um, yeah. You know, we're just seeing uh, AI being inserted into uh, applications that our customers normally use. Um, things like uh, Microsoft Copilot and ChatGPT um, and uh, things like that, where they're starting to use those things more often. Um, I do f- see that, you know, the nap- like the technologies that we use to protect our clients all are having integrative AI built into them. That will help. I mean, certainly. Yeah. But on the flip side, the bad actors will also take advantage of that too. And it'll just be sure. another ratchet level of technology and things that they can exploit and things that 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 we need to protect against. 
um, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's hard to envision how big it's going to be because it's going to be huge. Uh, it's going to, I think it's going to insert itself into almost every facet of our life uh, in ways that you can see in ways that you cannot see. Um, and uh, it's it's going to be interesting to watch it and to see how it yeah. how it how it actually develops. But how it does and where where it will go is, I think it's unknown, but it's also limitless at this point. Yeah. Uh, and it'll be very it'll be very interesting to see um, what's going to happen with it and how it's going to impact. But guaranteed that it will. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm going to ask you. I always finish with the same three questions, but before I do that, I want to ask you one last question on this. And if you're a small to mid-sized business, you're doing, you know, $1 million, $5 million, $10 million a year, um, you know, you've got something to protect and you've got an asset to protect at this point. What most of us, you know, are at the, that are at the you know, $5, $10 million range, we're on the Gmail suite or on Microsoft 365, you know, we're on, we're on kind of this off the shelf stuff, mm -hmm. yep. um, you know, yep. QuickBooks and, yep. and, you know, and then our POS or our CRM or whatever. What should a small to mid-sized business, you know, in that range, five, 10, $20 million, what should they do? Like if they're going to do anything, because you can offer this whole service of suite, uh, a suite of services and, you know, but I just know the average business owner and business leader is probably not going to, they're not going to invest until they feel the pain. Like they're going to have to get hacked first and then they're going to like, okay, what I want the platinum package you know but, yeah. but until that happens yeah, yeah. they haven't felt the pain mm -hmm. so the, for the businesses that haven't felt the pain michael what is at least the first thing or the smartest thing that that we all could do i think the first thing that any business should do that has any concern or question as to how to better protect themselves is do a risk assessment mm -hmm. you know do your own internal risk assessment and maybe you need some help to do that maybe you don't i mean you can you can get really good resources online through the federal government that can help you do an internal risk assessment. You know, there's there's all sorts of agencies. There's um, there's the Center for Internet Security (CIS). They've got great small business resources that you can Google. That all sorts of downloadable toolkits, uh, templates, questionnaires, risk assessment tools. Um, the other one is that that we use quite a bit is is what's called the NIST framework. So NIST is, stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's actually a department of the, it's part of the Department of Commerce in the federal government. It was actually built to help uh, industries, various, not IT initially, but various industries develop standards like electrical standards, like things of that nature. So it's become yeah. this kind of all encompassing. And then a few years ago, they came out with what they call the cybersecurity framework. And um, it's really become, I mean, there's CIS is another one. But NIST and CIS are kind of the the go to gold standard of of cybersecurity. If you want to organize yourself and learn about cybersecurity, then yep. those resources are super invaluable, and you can get them for free just by Googling. And you can learn about the NIST framework. You know, and it and it kind of lays it's very simple. It lays it all out. Like these are the areas that you need to be able to be aware of. These are the areas that you should focus on in order protect your business. It's, and it, it's, like I said, you just have to Google it. I mean, you don't need yep. technically an IT company like me to come in per se help you with that. You could yep. get a lot of information and a lot of learning just by using those two Center for Information Security, CIS, and then the NIST framework, uh, cybersecurity framework. Just Google those. Data. You'll get a ton of resources. And they're really focused. Your, your, a lot of them are yeah. focused on small business. You know, it's not, you know, you, you don't have to be it's not General Motors uh, level stuff. This is stuff that the average small business owner today can at least educate themselves on. And 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 I I would tell any small business owner that if you're not at least paying attention to this and 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 reviewing how it could impact your company, you're doing a disservice to your shareholders and your partners and everyone else. You have to be aware of it because it really could come around and cause you to have an issue and bite you big time. Yeah. Um, and it's probably not, it's not if it's when it's not, if it's, it's when. always yeah. when Yeah, it's, it's not yeah. if it's always when. Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, we haven't talked a lot about, cause this is just such, such a fascinating, uh, topic and I have not had a guest on to talk about this. So I've really enjoyed, you know, going deep on cybersecurity and just the threats that, that it, that it has and how it could impact our economy. But, you know, let's not forget you're, you know, you're a leader as well. Like you're, you're, you're a leader, um, in your organization, and so I know a lot of, you know, kind of the saying is, you know, leaders are readers. And, you know, I, I'm 
always asking my guests uh, to help the listeners have more opportunity to learn. Is there a book that you've recently read? Maybe you read it 20 years ago, but you know, Michael, when you set that book down, you said, whoa, that, that changes the way I'm going to lead, manage, I'm going to do my business mm -hmm. or just, you know, philosophically, it doesn't have to be a business book, you know? Yeah. What, was there a book or a text that you remember reading and mm -hmm. you said, whoa, yeah, you know, you'd so love to recommend it? There yeah. is. I, I'm, you know, I'm not a big business book reader. You know, I, I, I know, I know all the CEOs come out and like, oh, I read 20 books a year. I, I read 10 books. I, I don't, I mean, I had three kids. I got a wife who works. Sure. I got a business to run. <laughs> sure. You know, if I'm going to read something, quite honestly, I'm going to go read the latest spy novel thriller because I love sure. those. It's just an escape. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't read every book that comes out that, of the latest guru, but there was a book that I read that has impacted me and my company to this day. Um, and it's called, um, it's called Traction, uh, the EOS Entrepreneurial Operating System. Yeah, and you know what, I read that yeah. book 10 years ago and I was like, man, this just makes a lot of sense. And it was yeah. so easy, you know, and it just made so much sense. And we, I took it back to my company and my partner. I'm like, I think we should really spend some time to think about this. It would really help us run this business. And um, I'm the guy, they they call me the gadget guy in our, they always, um, uh, my whole staff in, from, and my partners, they're always teasing me because I'm always the one like bringing in the shiny object to the next sure. thing. And I'm like, I think we should do this. Uh, and uh, so they, they get a kick out of that. And then I often have to remind them that all the operating systems that we use to run this business were because of me, you know, uh, so <laughs> they can laugh at me, but watch yourself. So, yeah. uh, but I read that book and um, I was fascinated by it. And, uh, you know, cause you know, you run a business today and there's just so much stuff going on and you're not, you know, you know, you're a small business owner and you're just wearing so many hats and you're trying to keep everything running and it's just can just, it just can get to you. And, um, I just found that this helped me find a kind of organize my thoughts and how the business does. So we put it in place and then we actually purchased some software that helped us run and implement the level 10 EOS traction system. And that was almost 10 years ago. We use it to this day. I mean, I run uh, probably five or six level 10 meetings a week. Uh, yep. We have an operations meeting. We have a sales meeting. We have a, a couple internal small team meetings. Uh, I, we run it for our leadership group. We run it for our, my partner and I, so we, ha and I, you know, if you looked at my, so I use, um, what, well, it was traction tools was the software, but now it's called bloom growth. But if you looked yep. at my bloom growth, you'd see a list of probably 10 level 10 meetings that I run, uh, on either a weekly quarterly uh, basis. Yep. Um, and that book, man, that, that changed us to the full yeah, better. I love it. I love it. We we run traction here as well, and use no, there you go. as well. Yeah, it's uh, so, it, it just it organizes it organizes the chaos. Yeah, yeah, organizes the chaos. Yeah, yeah. And we're always um, trying to get better at it. Ten years in, we're still trying. You know, we'll sure. fall down on certain things. I I just said to my team the last week, I said, you know, I think we need to reorganize how we do some of our weekly in meetings in terms of like planning for resource allocation and project management. And I said, you know, this might be give us a chance to kind of re revisit our some of our level 10 meetings and see, are we really doing the right, are we really doing a good job at it? And what I really found was, is that we were doing a good job at it on the weekly basis, but some of our quarterly annual stuff, that type of level of EOS, we weren't really doing a very good job at that. So yeah. it's, it's, for me, it's kind of a, we're refreshing our approach to it. Um, and uh, going into the Q4 of this year, um, we're looking to reorganize that piece and we're going to re reharden ourselves on, on some of the EOS principles that I think got a little wishy-washy down the road. Yeah. Uh, th there's a lesson for the listeners right there, man. Even if you're doing something, go back and revisit 100%. it because we, we slip, we know human we beings, slip. we just, we tend to All slip. the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll ask a couple questions and this one's a little different, but it's, it's always just interesting to hear. Um, so Michael, let's fast forward to the end of your life and you've lived this beautiful, rich life, raised three kids had this, uh, very successful company, but you know, it's come to the end. And we're at your funeral, you're looking down from above or wherever, and there is uh, a loved one reading your eulogy, but that loved one can only pick three words, three descriptors that describe the life and the impact you lived and the impact that they had on, on you. What, um, what would those three words be? Uh, well, they'd be related. A great dad, a great friend, uh, and a great husband. 
those three things. It's family Love to it. me. It has nothing to do with this business yep. and what we what I do professionally. That will be forgotten on day two after yeah. I shut the door and hand the key over. Nobody cares. Yep. You know, don't get all balled up in it. There's ego portions of that, but at the end of the day, at that when you when you are in that wherever place of worship or whether you're getting tossed off the back of a boat in a powder form, uh, I would want to be known as a good dad, a really good friend, and a good husband. And that's all that really matters to me. Just yeah. nothing else really matters. I, I always joke that, uh, you know, no matter what you accomplish in life, the size of your funeral and how many attendees will be determined by the weather that day. <laughs> that is so. also true. Yeah, yeah. That is also um, true. Yeah. And then last question, uh, well, well, second to last, cause I want to uh, find out where people can, can contact you or get, get help with, with your company. Yeah. Um, if you had a magic wand, Michael, and tonight you wave that magic wand and we wake up tomorrow and you with your magic wand have made one change to the world. You make one, you know, material change, which means the world operates differently. People think differently, act differently, whatever that is. If you could wave that magic wand tonight, when we wake up tomorrow, how would the world as we know it be different. How would the world be different as we know it? It's a very good question. It's very deep, Roger. <laughs> so that's my last one. Yeah, exactly. I guess so. Um, yeah. I think the elimination of global poverty would probably be the wand if I was to raise, if I was to wave it. Because so much of some of the so much of some of the up, upheaval that we, have, that we have in this world with, with migration and all that stuff is because people don't have opportunity where they live and they have to go find it. And if they have the opportunity where they live, they wouldn't leave because who would want to leave? You have everything yeah. you need, your family, your friends, you have water, you have housing, you have all those things. Uh, and a lot of that is just driven by poverty and the, and the lack of opportunity. So if you yeah. could wave a wand and remove all that, then you probably settle the world down quite a bit. And we wouldn't have yeah. all this tumult. So that would be my that would be my wand wave. Cool. Super cool. And then uh, most important question, if, if people want to connect with you um, or, you know, uh, en enlist your company for help and, and, and services, you know, how can they be part of your journey, follow you, connect with yeah. you and, and, and find out more? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn, Mike Beecher on LinkedIn at MP Beecher and MP Beecher. I don't even know my LinkedIn handle. <laughs> sure, sure. I have to apologize. We'll, we'll, we'll find it and put it in the yeah, show notes. I think you we'll can put Google it. it. Yeah. You know, Mike Beecher, Escape yeah. Wire Buffalo, and that'll come up. So Escape Wire Solutions in Buffalo, New York. And we've got clients all over the country. And um, you can find me. And if you ever need me, you can reach out via LinkedIn or you can email me. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty easy to reach, believe it or not. Cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. No, I love it, man. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. This has been a different uh, type of interview, a different subject. And uh, you've just been just a pleasure to, to speak Thanks, with. So thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for tuning in to the Thrive More podcast. Don't forget to take a look at the show notes for any of the resources that we mentioned during the podcast. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you have access to the latest and the greatest. You can connect with me on any of the socials at Real Roger Martin. And be sure to check out our website, thrivemorebrands.com. There you'll find information on the brands we support and information on franchising. Thanks again for tuning in.